All right, everyone. Uh, welcome again. This is Introduction to Open Refine, which is being put on by uh, jointly by the DPLA Outreach and Assessment and Metadata Working Groups. I'm Teresa Hebron. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Outreach and Assessment Working Group. And our expert today is going to be Helen Baer, who is Digital Projects Librarian at Colorado State University. Prior to going to CSU, Helen was an Associate Curator of Performing Arts and Digital Projects Librarian at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin, as well as a Metadata Coordinator at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, she has, has a lot of experience creating metadata for a variety of cultural heritage materials um, that ranges from costumes to personal effects to print publications, um, using many standards and vocabularies from across the GLAM library archive and museum domains. And uh, she would like us to know that she likes cats, hiking, gardening, and her family, but not necessarily in that order. And with that, I'll turn things over to Helen. Thanks, Teresa, for that lovely introduction. Today, we are going to talk about over-refine, and you don't have to know a whole bunch about it to learn a lot today. So we're coming from the perspective of folks who are interested in learning from the ground up. Let me see if my screen works. There we go. So we have a brief outline um, and it's not real strict. We're going to spend about 20 minutes on basics of open refine. We'll move on and look at some more advanced techniques for maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then I would like to save some time at the end for a few closing remarks from myself and then some questions from you. Briefly, I do want to mention there's a few things that we're not going to do today. Um, we're not going to talk about crosswalking, even though it's an extremely important part of our work with metadata for DPLA and for our own institutions. Um, we're just going to assume that all the data is where it's supposed to be, okay? Um, we're not going to do the kinds of hands-on work that you would see in like a full open refined workshop, which would be uh, a lot longer and take a lot more preparation. So this will be a class where I demonstrate to you the various things that you can do with open refine. And there's a couple of points um, in the work today where I'm going to skip over something that would take a little bit of processing time and we don't wanna sit and wait for three to five minutes. So just wanna give you a heads up on that. So today we are chefs in the kitchen, learning how to clean up metadata and make it look beautiful. So let's put on our chef's hat, going. So I wanna tell you a little bit about Open Refine. It is an open source desktop application and it is made specifically for data cleanup. And open source means free, yes. So there is no cost in terms of purchasing software. Um, it has an interesting history. It was created by a company called Freebase back in 2010 and it was called Freebase Goodworks. And then very quickly after it hit the market, Google bought it up because they wanted to use it for some of their applications. They only held onto it for a couple of years before they released it as open source in 2012. And it has been open source since then. So it has a long history, I would say at this point. It has been maintained since that time by the lead developer, Tad Guidry, and a small, a very dedicated and very talented folks who make sure that it keeps doing updates and that new features are added as the community wishes to see that work done. Some of the things I really like about OpenRefine as a tool for me to use are that it has really excellent user documentation. So they actually upgraded the documentation a couple of years a couple of years ago, and it is spick and span and really easy to use. There's also a very active forum about OpenRefine. So if you're looking for the answer to a question, there are several people on there who know almost everything there is to know about this system and can answer your questions. And finally, there's actually a book about open refine and this even though it's from 2013 you might think it's a little bit old i still think that it's an excellent reference if you're just starting out and need to learn something i believe it is free online um, i had the print copy it has a really nice little section about regular expressions which i'm going to talk about in a little bit so if you end up uh, diving down that path um, and need something to look at in front of you with your hands and fingers then that's a good a good place to go <coughs> Excuse me. So um, Open Refine creates a server on your computer, and then you access that server using a browser. And you might wonder, well, why all this silliness with servers? And the answer is security. Open Refine is made for people to be able to use it to work on data that is sensitive and cannot be released. And there are definitely commercial users of Open Refine who cannot let that data go out. So that's why it has this. Um, different and interesting setup. 
when you open up OpenRefi, it's going to open up this terminal window like you see here. Um, I have never really looked at it ever, so don't be scared of it if you're not an IT person. It's just going to show a log of what it's doing uh, while you're using the application. When it opens up, it has a workspace directory, which is where all of your data and your changes are stored. So uh, it is parked in a particular place on your machine. And this gives you the ability to transfer projects. So if you are working on something and for whatever reason you'd like someone else to work on it or you'd like to move to a different machine perhaps, that is possible with the way the system is set up. So since we are chefs in the kitchen today, we are going to talk about mise en place really quickly. And that's a concept in cooking where you get all your stuff set out in advance. So um, you want to get your pan ready. You want to check your recipe to make sure you haven't actually not put the oven on yet, because that's a bummer when you have to wait for the, uh, the oven to heat up. And so this picture of the bacon, peanut butter, brittle ingredients kind of tells you like how we think about starting some of our metadata work here. For today, I've already done the tasks of launching OpenRefine and also um, creating, or in this case, opening a project. So I've taken care of that for you so we don't have to spend any of our time on that here today. In this first part of our session, we will talk about some of the basic functions of OpenRefine. And this is where you really get to get in there and need the data and uh, make it into something that you want it to be. And these are the, the topics that we'll cover here in this first part. And I do want to say that sometimes this gets really messy, but that's okay because we're working with a data tool that allows you to clean things up. So just keep that in mind. Um, there are ways to go back and fix things if you need to. And because this tool is optimized for cleaning data, it is really easy to do these things. They've made it that way on purpose. So briefly, I want to introduce the data set that I'll be working with today with you guys, and it's called the Northern Colorado Veterans Oral Histories, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, there was um, a man in charge of this project, which ran for quite a long time. It has mostly wound down now, and he went out and conducted oral histories with veterans in the Northern Colorado area. And so we have at this point now over 500 different interviews, which is uh, a lot of interviews. And they, they talk about their experiences and their careers, uh, both in the military and afterwards uh, about their deployments. The data that we're looking at today is in Dublin Core. And here at Colorado State, we uh, present this information, this content to our library users in Content DM. So with that, I am going to go over to OpenRefine and we're going to start looking at some data and talking about how the system works. So let's give it a second here. So this is OpenRefine. Um, are you guys seeing this, this big fat tab at the top, the black bar, or is that just me? Because I'm wondering if I can move that. I think it's like just, you, just you, just Helen. Me? Great. Okay. I just didn't want to be in the way of anything. So this is OpenRefine, and this is the data set that I pulled in. When you want to start a project, you go up and you can click Open, and it will say, I can create a project, or I can open an existing project. And like I said, I've already uh, opened our project today. If I was to go to the Open Project tab, you would see a long list of projects that I've worked on over the last year or so uh, because I use this all the time. So let's explore our data a little bit. At this point, we're not going to be making changes. We just want to look at it. OpenRefine is fantastic for actually allowing you a window into the data that you already have. So um, like I said, this is Dublin Core data. We have title, alternate title, creators, dates, uh, all the normal things that you would expect to see um, in a digital collection. Um, right statements, of course, are part of that as well, especially because we're talking about BPLA data. And so um, let's take a look around a little bit. So you can see that I have 213 rows which in this case is the same as the records. And that has to do with the difference between splitting out multiple values per record or not. So right now I haven't done any splitting. So we can see there's 213 records here. And 
Um, let's take a look and see what faceting is in open refine. So faceting lets you look at your data, and this is probably the most popular feature of open refine. If you click on the little carrot at the top of any column, it'll let you do a facet. It gives you several ways to do that, but the one that I used almost exclusively is the text facet. And that simply allows you to see your values in one place and you can go through and take a look at them. So sometimes just passing your eye over a set of values is enough to tell you everything's good or, oh wait, I saw something that I need to get in there and try to fix. So um, that is a facet. On a collection like this, um, we have 213 records and we also have 213 choices in the title field. And that simply means that um, all the titles are unique in this collection. Not an especially important thing to know right now, but that's just sort of how you sort of understand some of the things that OpenRefine is showing you. Now, it gets a little bit more interesting if you look at a field like creator, and we'll open up a facet, again, a text facet, on the creator field. And now we can see we have um, 195 choices, and so uh, we don't have a full 213 different options showing. And basically, um, the way that we do our metadata here at Colorado State is that we, um, because we're using uh, content DM to present our content, um, in the creator field, we simply string together all the different creators when there's more than one, and they're separated by a semicolon. So that's why you're seeing the first person is the person who is interviewed in the data, because that's really the most important um, creator in our view. And then after that, you see um, you see the other folks who are considered to be part of the creator field. So you see uh, Brad Hoops, who's the man who interviewed all these people. And also um, the project that he ran, which was called the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Note here that if you hover over a value here, you can edit it, which is a nice little feature. If you if you see one little problem, and you know maybe I think that uh, I spelled Brad's name wrong, you can go in here and make a change where I just took out the O, and then hit apply, and you've just made a change in your data. You didn't have to sit around in Excel and hit Control F and go through um, all the hits that you would find that way. Um, you can simply change it within the facet, which is uh, really, really, really nifty. So another really nice thing about facets is that um, they give you even blanks. So if you had not used a field, you can easily tell that that's the case. And on this data set, I noticed that at the very bottom, there's a, a value for blank. And if I click on it, I can see that uh, Charles Archibek's interview, for whatever reason, is missing the creator. That's extremely helpful um, in a situation like with this data where the creator field is required and there needs to be something in there. So. Again, faceting is just a wonderful way to like get into and see um, what your data looks like. I sometimes use OpenRefine just for that purpose, even when I don't have any intention of actually uh, updating the data in any way. Um, and it's a great way to be able to spot errors um, more easily than, than trying to put on a filter on a spreadsheet program, basically. Um, Another nice feature of OpenRefine is that it's meant to be a workspace for you guys to sit into and actually do your work. And so if you find a problem like this where you have a blank creator, um, you can star that row and you can come back to that later and do whatever work you need to do on it. Because sometimes, you know, we don't want to go straight into making a lot of changes. Um, sometimes we simply want to um, Try to get a sense of, you know, for working with legacy metadata, perhaps like just how much work needs to be done. And along the way, we just want to keep track of the things in there that are going to need our attention later. So um, I like using the star function in OpenRefine. It's a really nice, simple way to, to make sure that you don't forget to come back to something. Um, I'm going to take a look at 
um, the rights fields now really quickly to show you another way that we can use facets. And I'm just going to close that creator facet just like that. And I'm going to close that title facet. And we're going to take a look at rights. So we have a field called rights. And this is uh, really a local field in terms of um, it directs our library users to um, our copyright libguide. Essentially, that's the real purpose of that. It's It makes a statement about the copyright status, and then it directs you someplace else to get more information. But that's not what uh, DPLA needs, right? So when we contribute our content to DPLA, we need to see a rightstatements.org statement. And that's what we have down here. <clears throat> so one thing um, that you can see right away, again, using a facet, is that um, all of my records have a right statement. So I fulfill that requirement at my local level at my institution um, of putting in a right statement for every record that I publish in the repository. So good. Now, if we um, turn our attention to the other rights field, the rights DPLA field, we can see that something is not quite right here. This first value, which is used in 25 records, is incomplete. And the second value has what seems to be the entire statement. So this is a real example from my repository. At some point, we had a data set where um, the right statement got truncated. And you, you can imagine what happened. Someone accidentally like hit the back button and then the data got copied down. And so I believe what happened was um, those records were not taken by DPLA as part of the aggregation process from the CSU libraries. And so those are rejected records. So we definitely do not want to be having our records rejected from DPLA. So um, one really easy and quick way to make sure that your write statements are all in place um, if you're in OpenRefine is just to open up a text facet and take a look. And if you want to fix this problem, you can do it, as I mentioned earlier, right in um, the facet. So in this case, I'm going to copy um, the full statement, which I can see displayed right here. And then I'm going to cancel out of that. I'm going to then edit the statement that is all messed up. And I'm just going to say, give me the whole thing. Now I'm going to click Apply. And what happens is because it's the same value for all the records now, now we just have this one value in writes DPLA. So um, I got to tell you again, the faceting is your friend because it allows you to see things that you wouldn't necessarily see. Like I don't think I ever would have seen a truncated write statement unless I had opened it up in OpenRefine or been notified by my DPLA hub that there was something wrong with my data. So. Um, that's a lot on facets. I do have one more fascinating example to show you. And again, I will close out these facets and we'll go over to, whoops, the medium field, which is over here. And this is our, our field for formats. We're going to open another text facet and take a look at it here. And we can see, and I'll make this slightly larger if that's helpful. We can see that, again, we have multiple values strung together by a separator, which consists of a semicolon and a space. And um, they start with born digital. Then we have a um, what we call an umbrella term at my institution, indicating that it's a motion picture format. And then there's a more specific format. And then finally, um, a format that addresses the content. And it says oral histories. So that's what we see for almost all of these records. But for another seven records, we also see transcripts. And so this is really useful to me when I'm working on accessibility things. Here at the CSU libraries, we're doing a lot of work on making sure that our audiovisual materials are as accessible as we can make them. And one of the primary ways to do that is to get a transcript up as soon as you can to, to go with the uh, the audio or video content. And so um, if I was to open up this metadata here in OpenRefine and take a look, I would think, well, I have a, quite a lot of work to do here um, on accessibility for this collection because 
almost all of these items do not have a transcript. So that's another nice thing that you can see very easily um, when you use OpenRefine. It's a little more complicated and not just not quite as good an experience when you use a regular spreadsheet program. Now, I have just covered faceting. Um, I next want to talk about filtering. So facets are really great when you have controlled values. So we're going to go over and take a look at a field with controlled values. Actually, we'll look at the type field, which is a uh, Dublin Core metadata initiative field. So we have four different ways that the type field is being used. There are no blanks. That's good news, right? Because it's required locally. Um, and you can see very easily, um, because they're really short, right? So we have moving image, we have moving image plus still image, and then plus text, and then plus text and still image. That information is really easy for me as a human being to look at quickly and understand. But when we have unstructured data that's not controlled with values from a vocabulary, for instance, that data you might want to think about filtering instead of faceting. And a good example of that is the abstract field, which is as uncontrolled as data gets here in this collection. And so if we were to do a text facet on the abstract field, we would see that instead of these really nice, clear choices here, there are 198 choices. And look how big they are. That's because they all talk about the people who are being interviewed. Uh, Jim Biggs sat down in Greeley and talked with Brad Hoops about Vietnam. He was born in Platteville, served in the States and overseas, and uh, was a door gunner on a rescue helicopter. Um, and then after that, he left the service and had other careers. So this is very dense data. It's not data that you want to have to read carefully if you're looking for something. It's just too much of it. So what we can do in this case is do a filter if you're looking for something in particular. And that's just going to pull up only the records that have that thing that you want. And so in this case, what I'm going to do is put a, uh, a text filter on the abstract field. And so what it does down here is it gives you a chance to type in what it is you're looking for. Note those of you who have regex experience that you can use regular expressions here, which is tremendously helpful. And we'll look at some of this a little bit later on. I'm interested in knowing which of these records discuss boot camps. And if I put in a filter, then I see that there are four records where boot camp is part of the abstract. So perhaps I was doing that because um, we were thinking about highlighting that content for some reason. Um, it doesn't really matter so much why, but the fact is you can do this really easily. And so that's a great way to uh, take a look at long, dense, um, uncontrolled fields. And if you're looking for something in particular there, maybe because you want to fix it, or maybe just because you're curious to know how many times a concept appears in that data. So I'm going to now talk about finding and replacing things in OpenRefined, and then we'll look at splitting and joining and a couple of other functions before we go to a section of questions from you guys, okay? So finding and replacing, you've got a couple of different options on finding and replacing. Now, I wanna stop for a moment because what I've done here is select four records, but there's 213 total and OpenRefined very helpfully tells you that. If I was to do any finding and replacing right now, I would only do it on those four records. So you gotta kind of watch this. So the way to get back to all the data, if that's what you need to do, is to click reset all. And then now you've got all your records and all your values. So um, we've already seen how to fix data on that rights DPLA statement. And that's where we simply uh, updated the statement right there in the facet, done. You can also um, do um, finding and replacing using Google refined expression language. It's called GREL, G-R-E-L. And this harkens back to the days when Google owned OpenRefine before it released it. And um, this is something that you just have to learn. Most of the functions are pretty simple. It's when you start to like combine them into longer strings 
that make it a little complicated, but I'm going to give you an example of how we um, how we use Grell for find and replace. So you may have noticed that I had left in tildes in my titles and also in my abstracts. And this is because with the content DM workflow, you have to take them out, take out the double quotes, replace them with tildes, put them back in. In this data set, they're still in here. And we don't like that, right? We don't want to see tildes. So if we do um, a filter um, for a tilde character in the abstract field, we can see that we have 47 records that are still having that tilde hanging out. And I don't want that. I want to replace that with the double quotes, which should be there instead. So what we can do is on the abstract field, we can go up to the little menu and edit cells is what we're going to be doing. And we're going to go in and do a transformation. And you'll notice that there's actually some common transformations available to you. What's really nice is that you can trim leading and trailing white space because that's a real bugbear in our data sometimes. Um, but right now we're actually going to do our own function and learn a little bit about how this works. So the value dot replace function is what we want to use here. And the way it is structured is you have two pairs of quotes. The first thing is what you want to replace. So I'm going to put my tilde in there. And then the second thing is what you want to replace it with. And I'm going to put in a quote here. And it looks like that didn't work. I'm going to try something else. That didn't work either. You know what? I might have to do a regular expression on this one. I think I may have chosen a poor example. But um, for instance, if I wanted to instead, um, I'm having trouble with a character. If I wanted to instead simply take the tildes out, I would say, uh, find this thing, this character, and then replace it with nothing. And I think we can, yes, we can see that here in our preview window. It's very helpful to have a preview when you're working on functions because sometimes you don't know what's gonna happen. And it's nice to know, to get a preview of what actually will happen. So you can see here that True Life Adventure series was in quotes and so was Zoo Parade and now that's gone. So if I wanna do that, I click okay. And now it says zero records, but what happened to my records? Well, the reason it says zero records is because I'm still filtering for a tilde in that field. And so if I click reset, now I get back to, there's no filter on abstract. We get back to all of our records. So um, that is how you use find and replace. It's a value dot replace with a very specific syntax that you have to learn. The nice thing about um, functions in Grell is that you can string them together. So if you want Grell to look at a line of text and do one thing and then go back and do it again with another thing, you can do that, which can really save you some time. Um, I wanna briefly look at splitting and joining before we stop for questions and we will use the creator field for this. So I'm gonna go ahead and close these facets. And what we'll first do is um, take a look at our text facet again for open refine. So here we have, we have 195 choices. Um, you can see that they all start with the name of the interviewee as we talked about before. So it's all very well and good to have data that's this tightly structured, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you might have data where like someone put the interviewee at the end and then your, your list of values as it is presented right now is not as useful. So what you can do is you can split multi-valued cells and that will give you a much nicer way to look at it. And this is such a common thing that people want to do when they're looking at their data that it's built in on one of these menus. And so if I go down to edit cells, split multi-valued cells, it's going to ask me what's my separator. And I've already put in here that my separator is a semicolon and a space. It gives you some new options down here, which honestly I've never used before, but there are all kinds of different ways you can do splits if you need to get into something more complicated. And then when we hit okay, now our creator list has everybody. 
and they're all in alphabetical order. So you can imagine how lovely this is um, to see this kind of thing. It is really, really nice to have a list of names. Sometimes that's what you need. Um, Brad Hoops, the interviewer, he here um, is on 211 records, almost all of them. Um, another really nice thing about facets, which I didn't bring up before, but I will now, is that you can sort them by counts. So if you're interested in knowing, you know, how many records have different values on them, you can actually look. At first, this might be slightly confusing. For instance, why does Cecil Carlisle have four records? And then Warren Garst, the wildlife photographer, have three records. And that's because um, their interviews were multi-part interviews. So there's four pieces of Cecil Carlisle's interview and three pieces of Warren Garst's interview. So that's um, something that is really really nice to be able to look at. Another thing you can do in a facet is you can click on the choices, but I didn't figure this out for a long time. And it will give you these choices in text. And if I hit control A, you can copy this out and use it in another application if you need to. And I do use this from time to time, um, just to take a look at data, or perhaps I need to move this data into another place so I can compare it to other data. So um, that's another really nice feature. Um, I want to talk briefly about undo redo. So we've done a few things today to our data set, and this is brilliant. You can go back if you make a mistake. So it's very, very nice. So suppose I decided that um, I really don't want to replace that tilde yet with just a blank, you know, with nothing. So I can roll back my changes to the previous change. And just like that, it's gone. If I want to, if I decide, oh, okay, I've thought about this a little bit more and I do want to do that, you simply click there. So that is a really excellent function. One more thing that I'll point out um, is that you can export uh, your projects, which I did this morning as a backup for this presentation. Um, actually, I can't really see the right button very well. Nope, sorry about that. I've got this black thing up here that I can't, there it goes, there we go. So, okay, I can't read those words, but this will basically take your entire project out and put it in a zipped file, a tar file to be exact. And uh, you can back up your work that way if you're really concerned, or you can pass it to another colleague if you need them to work on it. So with that, we are going to Take a few questions right now. I've just covered a lot of information about what may be a brand new system for y'all. So, um, Michael, do we have anything in the chat that we want to address? We do have a couple of things. Um, and if people want to add more, um, feel free to go ahead because we do have a couple to get through right off the top. Um, the first one is a point of order question. We're going to be sharing a rec the recording. Do you also mind if your slides are shared when we share that recording? Sounds good. Okay, awesome. I just wanted to make sure I asked before we we said anything official. <laughs> um, so the next question we have um, says, I forgot how to get to the abstract search bar. Would appreciate it if you could repeat. Thanks. Absolutely. So I think you might be talking about filtering here. And if you come up here, text filter is what you want to select. And then we're still over here in the undo redo. We have to go back over here. And then we see our filter, and then we can pull up everything that has that tilde in it. All right, and if that question asker was asking about a different window, please go ahead and just submit another question and we can um, answer that. Um, our next question um, is anonymous and says, is there a cheat sheet available online for Grell syntax? Yes, the, uh, the OpenRefine website has a ton of examples. Um, I actually used to have a cheat sheet <laughs> which I probably still do somewhere that a colleague of mine made many years ago. And I'd be happy to dig that out and pass it along with my slides after the presentation. But yeah, basically the other thing is that there's a lot of examples now of Grell online because people do use this system and you can find the answer to almost anything by Googling. All righty, thank you very much. Next question um, says, this may be outside the scope of this session, but I was wondering if Helen or anyone else has figured out a way to get reconciliation working with Library of Congress subject headings and LCNAF. Well, I'm glad you asked that um, because we are gonna work on that today. I have had a lot of trouble with that in the past. So I'm with you there. 
Um, the way we're going to do it to reconcile and to pull URIs is, is probably not the most ideal way because there can be some problems. So hold on just a little bit longer. Alrighty, if anybody else has some questions, um, feel free to put them in, but this is the last one that I'm seeing for right now. So if we finish this one, um, we can get going. Um, and that question is, um, can you undo a change without rolling back? For example, you undo uh, change three, but keep change four in a series of changes, one, two, three, four. No, and so this is something that I mentioned later on about things you have to be really careful of. This is linear only, you don't get to jump around. Um, so if I wanna go back here, and say, I want to not star this row. Um, if I then go, it's possible to blow away your changes is what I'm trying to say, which is kind of scary. However, I will point out one thing which I hadn't planned on covering. You can extract all the code from all the things you have done. And that can be really handy if, for instance, you didn't take the time to write out an expression and you need to use it again. What you can do here is choose which of the changes that you want to be included. Suppose I only want this first one. Um, and it's, it's described as a mass edit on cells in column creator. And this is the code. If I, if I was to plop this in, you can actually redo things like that. So I hope that's a little bit helpful and feel free to follow up with more questions later on that one. We did get one more question in the meantime then, Helen, um, and that says, um, if you have exported from a database and two database fields are merged, what would you use to split those fields? So they're merged into one field. I would probably use um, whatever separator was used and hopefully there's one there. If I'm misunderstanding the question though, please let, me, let us know and we can come back and look at that a little more carefully. But hopefully you're talking about data that is already given the separator, then you can go in and as we were doing um, earlier, you can split multi-valued cells. You can also make columns based on other columns. You can tell OpenRefine, this column has some stuff in it, but I also want it to be spread out into other columns. So that's another thing that you can do. And I think add column based on this column might be the way to go. Oh, maybe not actually. This is not something that I honestly do a whole, a whole lot of. But um, you can also do transpositions, all kinds of things in here. Oh, split into several columns. OK, that was kind of obvious, right? I just don't use it very often. I can say that my separator is a semicolon and a space. I do not want to tell OpenRefine to wipe out the original column, because I generally don't think that's a good idea. But you can click OK. And now you've got um, three creator columns. So that might be the answer you were looking for. Are there any more questions, Michael? Not at this point in time, but uh, folks, feel free to keep putting those in the... Oh, wait, we did just get one. Sorry. <laughs> um, is it possible to use OpenRefine for transforms? We have a list of articles that we want to put the titles into a table of contents field and are wondering if OpenRefine would be helpful for that. So you want to take the titles and put them into the table of contents. Yes, I think that would be possible. So it sounds like you have the title data that you want and you just need to get it into another field. And that is something that OpenRefine can do. All right, I'm gonna move on now um, since we need to get through a little more stuff before we have a more open discussion. Um, I wanna talk about an advanced technique and, oh, sorry about that. Um, now we're gonna turn up the heat a little bit. We're gonna talk about regex just a little bit. Um, they're a little difficult to learn, but they're very useful. And we're going to do this by talking about fetching data from an outside website and also reconciliation, which has already come up. So briefly about regular expressions, basically this is pattern matching, which humans are really good at. And then we have to tell computers how to do it, right? So we're telling the computer to look for a certain pattern. And you have to be very specific how you tell the computer that. Um, there's a certain language that was developed by an American mathematician in the 50s. And that's how we can use this because he made it. So the thing about regular expressions is that they're not in all applications. And so they are very robustly supported here in OpenRefine, but you'll find Excel doesn't do them. And once you figure out that and you wanna use them, you stop using Excel because the power is so good. Um, you are truly playing with fire if you are using regular expressions. So uh, take care to back up your data you know, and think about undoing and redoing if you do something that's destructive to your data. 
Um, a note for those of you who are already regex users, there are different flavors of regex and what you use in mark edit, for instance, may not necessarily be um, what is being used here in OpenRefine. So we're going to uh, do an example of fetching data. And our goal here is to automate a process that we could do manually. So what we want to do is add Library of Congress uh, subject URIs to our metadata. And this is to enable linked data to happen uh, by which our data becomes more interoperable and also more discoverable in terms of computers and machines talking to each other. Um, a subject heading for an example that's in my data is the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, and it does indeed have a URL, um, a URI from the Library of Congress. Uh, some of what I'm talking about now is covered beautifully in a lesson on the Programming Historian website, and that website has been around for a while, but it, it walks you through a lot of this very carefully and very slowly. So now we're going to go over and take a look at what linked data looks at looks like at the Library of Congress. Um, id.loc.gov is the linked data service website, and it's a fascinating page. You can see all the different um, thesauri and vocabularies that the Library of Congress maintains, which is just wonderful. It's quite a service to our community. And as I was saying, Cuban Missile Crisis is our example, and if you search for it you will find a record and it will take you to the page they have. It's very simple. It basically um, gives you a URI and some other information that lets you download the data in various formats. One thing that the Library of Congress has done, which is another wonderful service, is they have enabled um, what's called a label function. And that means that if I know the name of the subject heading, then I can actually um, pull the URI. So we're going to do that right now. And so we're going back to our data set. And the first thing we're going to do is make a copy because <laughs> I don't like messing with my data and not knowing what it was before. So we are going to edit this column and we're going to add a column based on this column. And you have to give it a name. We're going to call it LCURI, and value simply means we're taking the original value and we're copying it over. So now we have this brand new column right here. So the next thing we need to do, and I'm going to run through this really quickly in the instance of time, is we need to split out these multi-valued cells um, because we have more than one subject heading in a lot of these rows, right? So our separator has already been identified. I'm going to click OK. Um, now, if I take a look with a text facet, you can see that the various subject headings are now appearing in alphabetical order. Um, the next thing that we need to do is to make things really simple, I'm going to remove the subdivisions. So the subdivision, for those of you who are not deeply into MARC on a regular basis, is the thing that comes after the main heading. And so it qualifies or amplifies somehow the main heading. We want to take them off to make our lives a little bit easier. And I'm going to do that right now. We're going to do a transformation. And we're going to tell it basically, I want to um, take off a space followed by two hyphens followed by any characters and take that all the way to the end of the line. That's what that language says to this computer. And now you can see there's no subdivisions. The last thing, last thing that we need to do is um, computers do not talk in normal human language. They talk in very computer language. And we need to uh, replace our spaces with um, dollar sign 20. And basically, that makes it look like it's not human readable anymore. And it's kind of not. This is for computers to talk to each other. So we just did that. So if I want to see if my value is out there in the Library of Congress subject headings and I want to pull its URI, OpenRefine is totally, totally made to do this. And how you can do this is you can add a column by fetching URLs. So I'm just going to put URI here. Um, 
on the Library of Congress website. They cover um, this exact content. You have to take the name of the site plus the vocabulary plus the value. And this is the value that we have used now. And you need to put it into a string. And then when you click OK, this is where it gets really slow. So we're not going to do this live right now. What we're going to do is go over to my other data set where I have done this. And so what we have, this is what Library of Congress gave me. And you're like, what is this? I just want a URI. It gave you the whole contents of that web page that we looked at. So, hmm, what do you do? Well, what you can do is parse the data. This is a parse function that's built into OpenRefine. And I'm going to go ahead and select my parsing. You know what? We're going to do this even more quickly. Um, this is the value that I put in, excuse me, in the function. And it's basically telling me, well, you know, I don't want all this stuff. You gave me a lot of stuff, Library of Congress. What I really want is for you to give me the meta tag that has the attribute of the name is DC identifier. That's the only thing I want. And so you tell it that, and ah, look at that. That's starting to look like something that we want here, correct? It is indeed. So. This is still not exactly perfect. Um, we're very close. What we want to do now is get rid of the stuff at the beginning and get rid of the stuff at the end. And I simply did that with a value.replace. And now you have a URI. So this is a very interesting example. I believe this value here at the top corresponds to US Navy. So we're like, great, we're done, right? Well, <laughs> look at this. When you click on this, you're going to go to a page that says, don't use this. That's because this is a duplicate subject heading. So just be warned when you're working with data, garbage in equals garbage out. So in this case, you probably would not want to put this URI in your data. So I don't know why the Library of Congress site does this, but it does. And that can be really frustrating. So keep an eye out for things like that that happen. We are going to go back here and cover just a couple more slides before we stop for some more questions. So we fetched our data. This is what it looks like when you're waiting. <laughs> It'll just give you this percentage complete and you have to just wait a while. If we instead wanted to reconcile our data, um, we can also do that. And I won't be able to do this live either. And we're simply just gonna kind of show how the process starts. But if you want to determine, for instance, if your values that you're using locally are in the control vocabulary that you want them to be in, you can do that. There's a couple different ways you can bring into OpenRefine an outside control vocabulary, or you can uh, bring in local data if you're using, for instance, a locally developed thesaurus for certain data. So, and the way you do this is you select reconcile. It's at the bottom of that little uh, carrot menu on the column. And then you click start reconciling. What you get next is this page, and the Wikidata uh, reconciliation service is now built into OpenRefine because OpenRefine um, has a lot of good support for Wikidata nowadays, which is really great. Um, so, and then we're not going to do this right now because, again, um, this is also a very slow process. But you can just think about, you know, conceptually, you can go out to the web and reconcile against other systems. Or you can say, I've got my own vocabulary. What do I do to find out? If I'm using all of those correctly, you can do that. So I do want to mention briefly, briefly, that there are some things that happen in OpenRefine that are fairly common. It can be hard to install, OK? Um, if you're trying to bring in a very large file, you might have a problem with memory. And the way around this is to increase the memory allocation that your machine devotes to OpenRefine. And I do this regularly. I had a file of 2.2 million lines that I had trouble with. So if you're looking at that scale of work, then you might indeed need to increase your memory. Um, I already mentioned that the undo redo can be a little fraught, like you can blow away your work. So think about that. Um, people have workspace directory problems. I see this on the lists a lot, and I don't exactly know why I've never had that happen. But something to be aware of. And again, um, going back to the garbage at in, garbage out principle, um, if you have bad characters in your in your text, they're going to come right in. At least you can find them easily and zap them, right? But you know, open or find doesn't doesn't do anything about character encoding. So briefly, um, for workflows, 
in terms of using this tool, you have to think about your own metadata ecosystem. You want to think about where am I creating data or where am I getting it from and where's it going to go? And how does OpenRefine fit into uh, the workflow, the stream of work that you have to do? OpenRefine is fabulous if your repository takes batch updates, but it's not as useful if you don't have that functionality in your repository. However, I still find uses for OpenRefine, even that aren't immediately related to pulling data down, transforming it, and then uploading it again. So um, keep in mind, there's always many different ways to skin a cat, and the examples I used today could be used, they could be done in different ways, all of them, I'm sure. Um, I want to close by saying that you absolutely can do this. You know your data better than anyone else in the world. And that is extremely powerful because you're a human being and you can see the patterns that you need to find to make your metadata appropriate for whatever level it needs to be at. Um, there's lots of help out there. I've already uh, mentioned the forum. Um, the documentation page is super helpful. Um, being persistent and working through issues um, is most is really just what you need to do. Sometimes things get really complex and you might want to make yourself a little map or a notes document telling you uh, what you've been doing and what you're trying to accomplish. I have a few resources here on you. Um, for you, the user manual, again, really excellent. There's now a library juice course on OpenRefine. I believe it started this week. And you'll find um, several library carpentry lessons online that cover OpenRefine. And those are excellent sources. I go to them regularly. Um, and then finally, I want to acknowledge some of our colleagues out there in the world of libraries who have done such wonderful trainings and blog posts. And I learned a lot from all three of these people here. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And we will open it up to more questions now. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, this was a great session. Um, folks, if you have more questions, feel free to please uh, throw them in the queue. We do have one to start with. Um, and that says, is it possible to clean up existing data in a spreadsheet to fit into Dublin Core format? So now you're getting into the world of what should the metadata look like? So you're, and you're specifying Dublin Core. It depends on what the data looks like. You can do it, it just might be a lot of work. So if you're talking about MARC data and trying to make that into Dublin Core, what you're probably going to end up doing is using functions like joining columns with separators and trying to um, bundle up all types of really detailed information that is expressed in like one clump in Dublin Core, if that makes sense. So I would absolutely use OpenRefine for that kind of work. Um, but you may want to stop and think about your metadata mappings really carefully, especially if, like I said, the data is really broken apart, as it would be with Mark, for instance. Awesome, thank you. If anybody else has some questions, feel free to, to get those into the Q&A queue. Um, in the meantime, we have plenty of people expressing their thanks in the chat. Um, this was a lovely session. Um, oh, here we have uh, we have another question here in the, uh, the Q&A. Um, can you save chains of processes to use on various data sets? Yes, and I've done this. We've done this in my library where I had um, data that we needed to work on as a group. And what I did was, let me cancel this. I went to the undo redo, I extracted, I basically copied this data out into a text document and I saved those documents as little text files and people could copy the text document and put it right into OpenRefine and that saved them a lot of time because sometimes there are a lot of steps and you just can't get around that. So yes, totally doable. Awesome. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, we'll give it another second. We're seeing plenty more praise coming in through the chat. Um, but we'll give it we'll give it a nice uh, awkward zoom moment of silence. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. If we don't see anything that I, I think that might be all of our questions. If that, let's put in a brief plug for our feedback forum. Challenge, did you want to take that? Uh, yes, I will. We would really appreciate your feedback on uh, this great event. Thank you again, Helen, for hosting. Um, I will put that in the chat. So if you could just fill that out, that would be awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It was really a pleasure to speak with you today. I hope I've given you some ideas about how you might be able to use this and maybe solve some metadata problems because we all have them, right? So this is one. Of, this is a new power tool for you.
to get in there and clean things up. 